All right, we're going to finish up the needle tip calculator here. I think that we got up to looking at the code. I think we just glanced at the code. So most of our work today will be looking at the code. And then we're going to look at Deedle's Twitter search application. I did find one thing. I think you mentioned this. I had to, uh, I changed my documentation to um, say set the minimum um, SDK to 26 instead of 25. I think I had 25, but I ran into a problem when I tried to do it. Well, my instructions seemed to work pretty well today when I converted the Twitter to um, to run. So we'll see. Oh, okay, cool. Remember today for lab, um, if you have something done, turn it in and turn it into to, to, um, Canvas. Bring it up on your machine and then holler and call me over. Okay. spent a lot of time last time talking about the layout. That was where most of our attention was. That was most of where the new stuff was. Any questions about I, that? Yeah. yeah. I've, I've got a question. Uh -huh. um, in this scenario, there is, you, you have two, two rows. Mm -hmm. Could you have like one row for part of it and then have Two rows for another part of yeah, it? we we actually have exactly that. Okay. Um, I, I assume you mean columns, not rows. Right. All I right. do. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. That's okay. I mean, I guess I guess I'm using Excel terminology. I guess you could call these rows. Right. Yeah, but yeah. but yeah, this actually takes up two columns, and okay. these, I'm sorry, this actually is is one big column. Okay. This actually takes up each of these are in a column. And the way we did that is with there, there. In the layout, if you notice, we specified for remember the edit text and a text view just live right on top of each other. So both the edit text and the text view, we specified a column span of two. What that does is we've set the default, we've set the number of columns to two, and then we've said this guy takes up both two columns. So that's why this goes across two columns. The other thing you could do is if you want to get into a more involved layout, you can actually... Um, well, I, I don't want to spend tons of time on layout, um, but I, you know I might as well might as well mention this. You can include layouts within other layouts. So I could have I will turn the thing off, but I could have a I imagine you could do this. You could have a grid layout. Specify two columns. Within that, have a linear layout. And put three things in it. Stack them vertically. So what that would 
might mean is in row one, column one, or row zero, column zero, those three things would be stacked, and then you could have something next to it like that. So you could nest them, um, just like, like HTML. Or you could nest uh, linear layouts and other linear layouts. One thing I like to do is, like you could have a linear layout for the whole thing, and then have nested linear layouts that were oriented horizontally. So each row, essentially, would be a horizontal linear layout, and those horizontal linear layouts would be stacked. You might do that if you have something like less regular than a grid. All right, this grid is um, mainly two by two, uh, is mainly uh, two columns except for the first one. Or if you had something goofy where there wasn't a consistent number of columns uh, in the grid, you could make a linear layout of linear layouts, have each linear layout inside be horizontal and put as many things as you wanted to in. I absolutely encourage you to experiment and play around with uh, linear layouts. Or not linear layouts, or any kind of layout. Okay. And one other question. And in the grid layout, there's no reason why we can't put an image as well as... Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. The way it's set up is that each one of these, unless otherwise stated is going to go in the next available place in the grid. So if I say specify two columns, if I didn't do anything funny like overlaying them or, um, or um, having a call span, it would go first element, second element, third element, fourth element. I keep saying element, it's probably better to say view, although elements is I think a bigger, bigger term. But there's no reason why that could be two images, all right? Okay. It's showing an error. Oh, well, I don't know. That'll tell me. Okay, so let's look at this. If we remember from this, as soon as we enter an amount here, it does a calculation. Likewise, as soon as we play with the slider, it does a calculation. So let's take a, cl uh, a look at this. It says a few things a little bit different than other ways done, not drastically different, but a little bit different. First of all, notice that some of these things are declared as, as attributes or instance variables of the class, the class being activity. Does everyone know what I mean when I say an instance variable? Or an attribute, I guess, is, is another way to say it. Does everyone know what that means? How can I tell that these are instance variables? Yes? They're inside the class and not inside a method. In other words, they're directly inside the class. They're not inside a method. What's the advantage or what's the impact of declaring variables like this? Yes? Yeah, you can use them throughout the class without having to pass them as an argument or something. So this one starts out by declaring a bunch of things that it's going to use in, in several different places. So it declares uh, a, a number format. a percent format, that's used to format the dollar amount and to format the um, percentage. The bill amount, the percent, which it defaults to 15%, which by the way, better match what we set the default in this guy for, right? It's one thing I don't like about this code is it actually has that default percentage in two places. All right. Then it defines these three different, I'm sorry, four different text views. 
text view for the amount. text view for the percentage and these two text views. It actually doesn't declare an instance variable for the enter text field, nor does it declare it for the slider. All right. And we'll see why it doesn't have to. Okay. We call the superclasses on create method and we set the content view. Same thing we've done in every single application so far. We grab pointers to these things. And these six pointers correspond to the six instance variables that are defined up there. Or six of the instance variables defined there. We point to the edit text field. Notice this one isn't an instance variable. Really, the reason for that is the only reason we need to point to it is to set the listener. Okay? We point to the edit text field and we point to the seek bar with these two instructions. And then we set the seek bar, listener, and the amount edit text watcher. Notice that these are different kinds of listeners, right? With the button, we add on click listeners. Why? Well, that's what you do with the button. You click it. So there's an on click listener on that button so that when you click the button, something happened. Here, there's different kinds of listeners. We're listening for different events. We're listening for the user to change the value of the text. All right. So we are adding an at, we are adding a text change listener to that text box. If you remember, the edit text field is the field that is hiding behind this static text field. Same thing with the seek bar, except we're setting the seek bar change listener. All right, to look for and wait for us to start sliding this guy around. So two things are going to initiate an action here. All right, one of them is if you type in the edit text field. The other is if you slide the slider. Now, let's just look at those listeners. I'm not going to study them too closely, all right? We're going to go back and study these, but we're going to look at them kind of on a high level first, and then we're going to look at them in more detail. What does the onSeek bar listener do? It has three methods, because there's three methods in a seek bar listener. Remember, the onClick listener is only one method. Here, there's a different method different methods because it's a different kind of listener. But what we're interested in is when the progress has changed. In other words, as if we slide it on, slid on, if I click on it, it doesn't really matter. But if I've slid this to a different number, that's when the code executes. And notice what it does. It sets a variable, and then it calls the calculate method. That's a method up here. Let's look at the edit text watcher. Sorta of does the same thing. It grabs some values and then calls calculate. So at the end of the day, both of these call the method calculate. All right. We talked a little bit before about how our listeners aren't going to typically have tons of code in them. They're going to call other functions. They're just managing the communication between the element that the listener's on 
and the rest of the code. So we'll come back and look at these listers in more detail in a minute. But suffice to know that both of them, after they've done their thing, are calling the method calculate. And this method is pretty straightforward. So we'll just we'll take a minute to go over it. It grabs a value from the percent text view. That's this value right here. It grabs a value of the percentage. Oh, I misspoke. It doesn't grab the value from that percent text view. It sets the value in there. What that does is that keeps the value of this synced up with this. So if this is all over to the left, it changes that code to zero, changes that field to zero. If it's all over to the right, it changes it to 30. So what this does is it sets that text field. It doesn't get the text field. And it sets it to the percentage instance variable. Remember, percent is an instance variable. We can use it throughout a bunch of methods. We set it down in the listener, and we're using it here to set that other text box. We do a calculation to calculate the bill amount and get the tip by calculating the bill amount times the percentage. That's our tip. Our total is the bill amount plus the tip. And then we display in the tip and in the total the values of the tip and total. Pretty simple, right? It's a nice thing about uh, programs that are written pretty well, right? Is that if we look at any individual function, it's really straightforward. All right? It's, it's really straightforward what this does. All right? So it, all the calculate is doing really is it's setting the values of different text fields on the UI and doing some calculations. Does so anyone have any questions about this function right here? Remember, we didn't look at the mechanics of the listener yet. I want to spend a little bit of time on that. But we looked at them long enough to see that both of them call calculate. And this is what calculate does. It does the actual calculation and it sets certain things on the screen. Any questions about that? All right. So the only thing we have to look at are the listers. Now, this is different than the other examples that we covered because in the other examples we covered, for one, we had a button. But maybe more significant than that is our main activity class implemented the listener interface. It implemented the on-click listener interface. This guy does not do that. Our activity does not implement any listeners at all. So I am not allowed to say Add, check, add text change listener this. Can't do that because this activity object doesn't have uh, those interfaces in it, doesn't implement those interfaces. So what objects do implement those interfaces? There's two. There's actually a class or an object that's defined right in the class itself. And they put it at the bottom. I probably would have put it up, up top. Because this is really another instance variable. It's another object. What type of object is it? It's an on seek bar listener. On seek bar change listener. And the name of the object equals seek bar listener. We have the same thing for text watcher. Private final text watcher amount edit text watcher equals new text watcher. So that creates a new object, all right, a new text watcher object 
named text uh, named amount edit text watcher and a new seek bar listener named seek bar listener so those are our objects those are our listeners all right and they're of this type Now, those, because they are of the proper type, we can use those to set the listeners. So, amount te edit text watcher, that's a text watcher listener, so we can set that to the listener of that edit text field. Same thing with the seek bar listener. This is a different way to define a class than we've seen before. Typically when we have a class, it's in another file, it's in its own file, all right, and it has a name, all right. We're defining it using this interface. The object has a name. But the class that implements that interface doesn't really have a name. This is what's called an anonymous class. All right? This class, there is no class name here other than onseek listener. And that's actually an interface. Normally, if you were going to do this in a separate class, would say something like, public class my spinner or my seek bar listener implements on seek bar listener and then would define the class here we define the class sort of just like right smack dab in the middle of our code not in a separate file so I say new seek bar listener and I couldn't leave it at that Let's cut this briefly. Let's try to leave it like that. It's not going to let me. Why? Because I can't create a new instance of an interface unless I supply an implementation of that interface. Unless I supply the functions that are contained in that interface. Now, normally I do that in a class. Or what we've, maybe normally is the wrong word. What we've seen in the past is us doing that in a separate class. Here we're doing that inside this class, and we're not even bothering to give that class a name. We're just putting that interface logic, the code that implements that interface, right smack dab here between the curly braces. So this is actually a class that's created that doesn't have a name, that implements on seek bar change listener, and is defined inside another class. So this would be an inner class because it's defined inside another class. This would also be an anonymous class because there is no class name associated with this. We simply specify that we're implementing that interface and we're supplying the code for the class for the implementation right here. Well, we can conclude from this that there must be three methods in an on seek bar listener, on seek bar change listener. How can I conclude that? Because I see three methods inside that definition. There's an on progress changed. There is a start tracking. And there is a stop track. All right. So these methods, again, are wired through the framework that this method will go off once you start moving that seek bar. This will go off once you've stopped. So as I drag and stop. And this one fires off on seek, uh, on progress changed when the value has actually changed. I need to define all three of those because all three of those are in the interface, right? 
Now, we don't have any code for these last two because we don't need any code for the last two. But if we were to try to get rid of that code, yeah, this inner anonymous class no longer implements this interface. All right? Because it only implements two of the three functions. Now we don't get an error on that because it implements the three functions that are on here. All right. Questions at this point. We have this object called seek bar listener. What class is it? It's an anonymous class that implements this interface. These two methods aren't really used. This is the method we're interested in. Now, Notice this method, and remember, these are methods that exist in the Android framework. So automatically, when I move that, that seek bar and I change the value, this gets called. So even if I'm not done changing it, as the value changes, so as I move it, the value, as the value changes, that changes and calculates. So every time the value changes that seek bar, this method gets called. Look to see what this does. This method gets passed three arguments. Hint, hint, this is one reason why we don't need to make this guy an instance variable, the seek bar. Because this function gets past everything it needs. This function gets past the seek bar. So if I need to do anything with any of the properties of the seek bar, this function gets past it. So I don't need to make it. Why did I say we made instance variables so I could use a variable throughout the application? And I wouldn't have to pass the argument everywhere. Well, this guy gets past the argument of the seek bar. Cool. It also gets passed an integer saying the progress. Remember, it's one of the attributes of a seek bar. Remember, we defaulted it to 15, and we said this can go up to 30. So in other words, the, pro the, the progress is going to be a value from 0 to 15. I want to show you something. This is seek bar, and here's some of the attributes on it that we're interested in. Progress, max, and so on. Let's look at Java docs. For seek bar. If we look down here, blah, 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 blah. We don't see that attribute. We don't really see any attributes. Well, maybe it comes from here.
Sometimes we have to look up the food chain, if you will. And what I'm looking at is the XML attributes. XML attributes is progress. That's in the progress bar, of course. But that's also an attribute. I can call get progress. And get the, the, the progress associated with this. I might be a little confusing the issue. What I'm trying to say is this, that what we see in the XML for these different objects are properties of that object. We are just setting them through XML instead of the standard get and set methods like we typically use in Java. So I'm sure there is a seekbar.setprogress method where I can set the progress to something. But we can also set the progress attribute through the XML. That makes it easier to design the layout and saves us some Java code. OK. For us, though, we don't have to worry about any of that here. All right? Because pass to this function is the actual value of the progress. So when the progress changes, this gets past that as an argument. So we take that, divide by 100, and that's our percent. Okay? Percent, remember, is an instance variable. So we've set that percent instance variable, and we can put that value inside this text box, and we can use that value in calculation. So all we do when we finish dragging that, and we not when we finish dragging, but when we change the value to it, is set our instance variable for this is the percent tip we want, then it calls calculate. All right? These two functions don't do anything. The story is almost exactly the same for the text watcher. All right? There is, there are, Three methods for this, before text changed, after text changed, and text changed. Seems a little redundant, but you can do all kinds of things uh, by using different methods. In this case, we want to, after the user has finished typing in the text, um, to go and do the thing. So. We wrap this into a try. Now, this is a little bit of potentially redundant code. This is maybe the equivalent of wearing a belt and suspenders. All right? Because I've said in here, where did I say that? I said in here that we can only enter numbers in here. And yet, we're wrapping this into a try-catch command. Just on the odd chance that maybe somehow someone making a change to our code or whatever and allowed an alphabetical character to get in there. This should never throw an exception, right? Because we've said the interface can only accept numbers. However, if someone messed up the code, this is like an extra uh, fail-safe thing. That like, okay, if someone messes up the interface and allows characters to be entered in, at least this won't blow up. So, what do we do here? We have it wrapped around a try just on the odd chance that someone types in something goofy. We take the value from the edit text field, was S, We parse double it, so we make it into a number, then we divide by 100. Now, the reason why we do that is, remember, that you're actually entering into this edit text field. We're entering in the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 
and it's automatically changing it if we type a 1 in to be 0 0.01. 1, 2, 0 0.012. 1, 2, 3, 1.23. It displays it as a currency in this field. And that's what this does. So the bill amount is actually what I've entered into the edit text field. And if you remember from class last time, the edit text field just has a number with no decimals in it. We divide that by 100 to get the, the dollar and cents amount. And then we set the value of the other text view that's on top of our enter text field to format it nicely as currency. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. If we were to do something similar for our homework assignment okay. on this, one of the comments you had was to have uh, some sort of validation on it. Would we, if we define it as a number, would we want to also do the try catch? Refresh my memory. Which assignment? Um, this is the one for the uh, currency uh, exchange. Okay. So you are like converting from dollars to yen or whatever. Right. So if you define it as numbers, should you also wrap it and try catch? Yeah. I would suggest do the okay. same thing like, they do, they, like they're doing here. Okay. In this case, it's defined as number, but they're still, they have that fail safe in there okay. just, to, just to be extra solid. Okay. Okay, so we've set the bill amount, which was what? An instance variable. We set that second text view that's on top of our first text view. There should never be an exception, but if there is one, this is what we do. And then finally we call calculate again. What's calculate do? It sets a percentage text. I don't know why they don't have that here in the seek bar change. If I was coding it, I would do it there, but eh, who cares? They do the calculation, they display the results. Questions about this? The key thing I think for this is a couple key things. <laughs> All right. The key thing for this is that there's a bunch of key things. No. The key thing for this is, is are several things. Number one, we're using different controls. I guess the main different control we have is we have a, uh, a slider control. Or, uh, yeah. A, uh, a, a seek, why, why can't I think the name of, it, of this right? The seek bar control, all right? We have a seek bar control, which is a different object, a different kind of view. Um, the other thing is, because we're not doing anything off of a button, we no longer have an on-click listener. We're doing things when someone enters text. We're doing things when someone moves the seek bar. Therefore, we have different listeners that correspond to that. Lastly, not only do we have different listeners, we're defining those listeners differently. We're not defining them by making this class implement those two interfaces. We're defining them by creating these inner anonymous classes. I could say that this class implements on seek bar progress changed and on edit text text change. I could implement both of those listeners as part of this activity class. Wouldn't be that hard to do. Let me make a copy of this real quick. All right. I'm going to call it tip calculator 2. And I will post this as well. I could do this. 
implements. Okay, I've implemented those interfaces. It's give me an errors because I don't have any of those functions. What would I have to do? Well, I could just remove these fun these these inner classes. And now, this one activity class has implements those two interfaces. Here are the functions for the text watcher. Or no, here are the functions for the seek bar. Here are the functions for the text watcher. And it's going to work. All right? Well, let's talk about it. What do you see as the advantage over one versus the other? Let's make sure it works first. I'd hate to go through all this and find out it don't work at all. First one's cleaner code. Why? Yeah. I would say that when we did the first example with the button, there's only one listener, a button. All right? And therefore, it's not much more complicated. It, 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 it's not that complicated to add that code to the activity class, right? To say it implements a button listener, put an on-click method here. Here, each of these requires three listeners or three methods. So there's six new methods in here. So now my stuff is cluttered. At a glance, unless I do a really good job commenting, what's this function for? Well, you need it to implement that interface, and oh, unless I have comments in here, it's really going to be cluttered. Using the other method, I can see at a glance, hey, this is a chunk of code that is responsible for implementing the text change listener. This is a chunk of code that is uh, implementing the uh, seek bar. And I'm getting an error. Cannot find symbol. Oh, I have to change these two to say this. Because those are no longer there. So now I should be able to run this. Works like before. The difference is, is the cleanliness of the code. All right. Uh, so much of programming is about taking something and breaking it down into parts. All right. And so if I have one class that has a bunch of stuff in it, or three classes, each which do their own thing, chances are three classes, each which do their own thing, is probably the better approach. All right. Now, the other good news is when I define an inner class, it can access all of the instance variables of its parent class. That's another nice feature, too. But one big class that tries to do the job of three classes probably isn't as well written as three classes, even if two of those are inner anonymous classes, that each just do one thing. That's that class's job, to be the lister. That's this class's job, to be the activity and so on down the line. Other than that, not 
particularly a big difference. Why did we do it the other way on the first one? It's easier to it's easier to demonstrate. You know, it's simpler to have just one giant class that does everything. I can explain it quickly after a brief review of interfaces. Questions? All right, I'll put this I'll put this second version up just for giggles. All right, so you can look at it and compare and contrast and 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 play with it if you want to. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to be difficult today. All right, it's it's been a long hard week. Your t it's not it's not a homework assignment, but if you want to as an exercise, try to duplicate what I just did here. Make it so that there's only one class that implements those two interfaces and all the code is in the one class. Try that if you want to. It's probably better hands-on learning. If you're not interested in that, you don't have to. All right, but I think it would be a good exercise to, uh, to play around with. Next week, we're going to do the Twitter search. So you might want to download that over the weekend. Uh, and, uh, and play with it a little bit. All right, any questions? All right, see you in lab. I'll go unlock the lab. I'll come back here to grab my files and, and computer, and then I'll be back over them. Remember the drill as far as your labs. Submit them to Canvas. Pull them up on your screen.